one of the things that's important to me about Midsummer is that there's so much beauty and delight in the language, in the creation of the fairy world, in this group of mechanicals who create this play within the play. The funny is all there, the whimsy is there, the delight is there in the language. I was really interested in looking at love because I've always felt that Midsummer, you have an exploration at love at three very different stages. You have these four young people, these people who, kids who run into the forest in the throes of that teenage kind of, I love you, I will never love anybody else, nobody understands our love, and then it's gone in an instant and you go away to college and you never, you can't even remember that person's name 30 years later, right? But it's so all-consuming. Then you get Theseus and Hippolyta about to enter into this very public marriage, which is going to be celebrated by the community, they themselves, in the text, there's not ambivalence, but there's definitely um, struggle there. There's struggle. They're both giving something up to, to join together. So it's this, I deliberately wanted Theseus and Hippolyta to not be sort of... Uh, I wanted them to be older than they're usually cast. I wanted it to feel like there was sort of a life had been lived before this decision to join together. And then you have Titania and Oberon, the king and queen of the fairies, and you get at the beginning of the play a marriage that really is broken and that is full of recriminations and accusations and um, they can't even be in the same room with one another. The anger is so is so potent. And I they need over the course of the play to learn how to let that go and to sort of come back to one another, to see one another again, to learn, uh, I need to spend time with you, I need to see what your needs are, to learn how to compromise again. Um, so in that sort of swirl of these three very different phases of love and life, that's where I wanted, I, I knew that I wanted to make Theseus a priest and Hippolyta a nun, so that each of them was giving up something profound to, and, and, and making a huge sacrifice to, to join with the other person. That it wasn't just Hippolyta being pulled from, you know, an Amazonian court to marry this guy, that I felt like there was... I felt I felt like because Shakespeare had invented this these crazy kingdoms, it 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 it's, it gave us license to to look more deeply. I chose 1964 because, as I said, of the Vatican II. Also because musically it was a great year. As I said, it was uh, you know the Beatles released six albums in this country. A Hard Day's Night. It's just an incredible. You know, popular music was becoming really popular. Um, and it was before I knew I wanted to set it before, um, you know, uh, before things really got bad in Vietnam and before uh, sort of, you know, hippies and flower power. And I knew I wanted the kids to have a sense of um, innocence is, is, too, is too easy a word, a sense of... Um, I didn't want them, I wanted them to feel protected. And I think sort of post-Vietnam, nobody felt that anymore. And so I think I wanted them to feel the pre that. Um, so that the notion of when they go into the forest, these four young people with their, with their passion and, you know, fleeing the sort of the strictures of their, of the school and all the rules that the simple act of unbutton, you know, a, a high school, Catholic girl in 1964 unbuttoning her top button had as much danger and thrill as like today you know some kid taking off their top at spring break like it was it it, it had the sense of uh, of 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 real danger um, so I knew that world in that sort of 64 Catholic school world it it the mechanicals it. You know, in the original, they are uh, workers and craftspeople who live in Athens and are doing this, putting on this play for the Duke's wedding. And I thought, well, this is perfect. They're faculty and staff at the school who are putting on 
celebrating the marriage of their headmaster and one of the nuns who teaches at the school. So it, it sort of just became a no-brainer, right? Bottom is the gym teacher, Snout became the lunch lady, you know, there's the drama teacher, the math teacher. Um, and in a way, it, you know, the, we had our table read last night, and I realized I really don't have to do anything, especially with that group. I just have to stay out of their way because they're all already brilliant and, and hysterical. And then with the fairies, you know, I started, I knew with the fairies, I've seen a lot of fantastic productions where the fairies, I saw um, my little sister played Hermia in a production set on the moon, and the fairies were kind of alien creatures. I've seen, you know, so many different things, and I thought, I want the fairies, I want to return to some basic understanding of fairydom. So I asked my son, who's seven, to tell me what a fairy looked like. And he um, you know, looked at me like I was really dumb and said, well, you know, daddy fairies have long dresses and they have wings and they have pointy ears and they're really, really tiny because they need to live in under flowers and, and mushrooms. And I thought, yeah, the fact that he knows that already, right, that that's a sort of accepted notion, that's a very Victorian notion of fairy, right? That's not contemporary, because you can see Tinkerbell on Disney. That's not, she doesn't wear a long dress, and, you know, it's a, um, and it's actually, so I knew that I wanted the fairies to feel uh, timeless, that they, I thought, okay, well, let's, if the fairies are the only things that haven't changed, so literally, they were what Shakespeare thought fairies looked like. Um, and there's something about the fairy court. You know, when we first encounter the fairies, we see Puck and, and, the, and the other, other fairies before we meet Oberon and Titania. But when we meet the king and queen, it's very formal. And so I thought, this is perfect. They should be, it should be Elizabeth and her court. And he is, you know, the Earl of Essex or somebody. You know, that, that, that we... It had this sort of courtly feel to me um, as a starting point. So we are going with very Elizabethan, Elizabethan uh, design choices with the, you know, the, the corsets and the big, big skirts and the ruffs. And, um, and the, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful you know, time period for clothes for men and women, just gorgeous. So over the course of the play, um, you know, I, I've always felt there's this wonderful progression that I think sometimes doesn't get tracked, which is basically Titania and Oberon, as I referenced earlier, they need, over the course of this night in the woods and the argument over this changeling boy and her, him playing this terrible trick on her and making her fall in love with an ass, they sort of find their way back to one another. And they find their way back to sort of, I think, their truer selves. So what happens over the course of the play is those that, that those Elizabethan very structured constricting cl clothing gets peeled away and they get to be revealed um, as they truly are which is way more uh, connected to the natural world. Just I've also cast six kids as the fairies, except for Puck, who is played by Gina Daniels. And I wanted that sense, too, of, you know, you see these Elizabethan paintings, these family portraits, and you see um, the, you know, the parents and then the kids, and they're dressed identically to the parents. And then you just think about what was life like for these kids in court, you know? the rigidity and the structure and the etiquette and all those different things. And I wanted that sense for these kids following the rules, but then desperately wanting to break out and actually be kids again, which they get to do as the, as the play progresses. Um, so in a way, you know, in a sort of way that I didn't intend, I think also this production of Midsummer has an interesting conversation perhaps for the audience because it has those two periods. It has a very traditional Elizabethan approach to the fairy world and then this 
you know, more modern, not contemporary, but a modern 1964 setting. So I'm interested to see how those worlds interact and how they inhabit the same space together. And I think that's, given that that's a big question for our audiences, is how does Shakespeare get interpreted, right? Do you, is it, does it have to be traditional, whatever that means for a person, or you know, can you set a production on the moon and is, is it as valid? And I think in an interesting way, completely not intentionally, I think this production has that conversation with itself. My intention always was to create a production of Midsummer that both my seven-year-old son and my 88-year-old mother and everybody in between could enjoy. I wanted this, I want this Midsummer to be for for families, for all ages, for just, I want it to be, um, you know, whimsical gets overused, but I really want it to be magical for people. Um, to have that experience sitting in that beautiful outdoor space with the stars over your head and watching this perfect play. Because I do think Midsummer, like Twelfth Night, it, they're, they're sort of perfect plays in their balance. So I think people should bring their whole family to see it because I think it's going to be delightful. <laughs>